Welcome back to the Gauntlet's GM Masterclass Podcast. I'm Kate, and I'm here with... Jason. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I remember how to do this, I swear. <laughs> been it a... has been a minute. It's okay. Yeah, it's been a long time. There's been, you know, lots of conventions. So thankfully, we're back and ready to talk about some hard sell players, people who are harder to bring with you as you go along being a GM. For our internal question today, Jason, actually, you decided to come up with a question. So what do you got for us? Okay, in the spirit of hard sell players, this is a great term, by the way. How do you encourage people to play characters who are different than them, particularly playing characters of color if they are not themselves a person of color? So funny story, I was actually at Fan Expo yesterday. And the last game of the day we were going to play was Cartel by Mark Diaz Truman. And I sit down at the table after everyone's already sat down because I'm an organizer and I'm busy. And the guy to the right to me goes, I'm, I'm going to play a French guy if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> she explained, this is, this is about Mexican people. This is not about French people. <laughs> so that, that's what I said. And he's like, yeah, but, you know, I talked to the creator and uh, he said it's not actually about that. It's like about uh, drug communities and small towns like he grew up with. And I was like, oh, OK, yeah, I, I don't work for Magpie. That's cool. <laughs> and the GM let it slide. And I wouldn't have. But the GM did. And that was their choice. But in these moments, I feel like it's a it's a moment to be like, OK, but let's talk about what this game is actually doing and why it's not OK necessarily for you to be a white person in a game exploring Mexican issues. Right. Yeah. What would you have said if someone had been like, I'm going to play a French guy? <laughs> I haven't run into it much. I mean, you know, I think there's like two different things going on, right? Like, I think there are like two different gaming scenarios. The one gaming scenario is kind of like you've presented like cartel is plainly about Mexican cartels, right? And the people who get wrapped up in that. And also another example, this is what spurred the idea for the question. I recently ran a series of monster hearts set in the 1980s ballroom scene, which is uh, largely queer people of color, right? Mostly black people yep. in Harlem. And, you know, for, for that kind of situation, you know, for true beauty, for example, I just told the players, you know, I said, Hey, look, this is what we're interrogating right now. Like you have to be young people of color. Like you don't have a choice. <laughs> so I just made it kind of mandatory, right? Like there was just like no other option. The harder thing I think is when we're just playing like a setting where it's not like defined like that, you know, like mm -hmm. you could be theoretically any type of person. And I think that's like kind of what I'm getting at. Like how do you get people to like actively choose to play someone who is not like them and i actually i don't know the answer i think that's why i posed the question because okay. i'm actually not sure you know so i've seen it handled a couple different ways i remember i was sitting down to play velvet glove and sarah richardson looked at us all and said if you all play white people i'm gonna be pissed <laughs> and i was like sold i will not play a white person for sure i don't want to piss her off the other thing I've encountered where I think this has been really important was I was sitting in a panel on diversity at Gen Con last year, and there were a lot of questions about essentially asking for permission for white people to play people of color. And Tanya DePass, who's amazing, you should all follow her, posted a tweet where she was angry that people of color were asked to do emotional labor by giving white people permission to essentially fuck up playing people of color. Right. And I was guilty of this. I, I didn't ask that question, but I had definitely struggled with my white privilege and been like, should I really be playing a brown person? Should I right, be doing yeah. that? Uh, yeah, I fucking should. So that's the answer. And part of that is explaining that when we don't have people of color in our game, we are essentially encouraging whitewashing and silencing of people of color and giving us our permission to fuck up. It's, it's like Seinfeld, right? I mean, like Seinfeld was a tv show that took place in is that, i'm getting a toronto shrug here <laughs> seinfeld was a tv show set in new york city where the principal characters and pretty much every other i was about to say npc every other side <laughs> character in the show was white and like it was like the whitest new york yeah. city ever right and you know, like, I find that, like, you know, in games like Urban Shadows, well, Urban Shadows is maybe not a great example because Urban Shadows actually presents on the character sheet, like, you know, options for playing people of color, right? Mm -hmm. But, like, in a similar setting, like in an urban setting especially, like, it's it's kind of absurd that there might only be one or no people Monster of color hearts. in the group, right? Monster hearts, yeah. All well, the time. On, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on, like, unless you're doing purposely doing, like, a ballroom scene, white rural, you know. <laughs> 
monster hearts or, or, or yeah, the opposite of, you know, the ballroom thing where there are no white people. Right. But, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, my feeling on it is I've never actually had a player say, I feel uncomfortable playing a woman if they're a man, or I feel uncomfortable playing a person of color if they're white. I've never had anybody like say that to me. So I don't actually, I've never had to like face it, but what I have had happen is I'm so busy, like focusing on my prep and then they're all making characters. And by the time we're done, I realize, oh, there are no women or black people in the character group, <laughs> right? It's like, so how do you handle that, Kate? What would you do? Like after, like, like post facto. So I come across this most often in Urban Shadows because it is set in an urban center and I run that game a lot. And even though the options are all there, everyone will play a white person. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that's that's okay. pretty egregious since the yeah. options are there right. yeah. so usually they're like so just a reminder like we're playing in toronto it is the most diverse city in the world our character should reflect that or when i'm running crossroads i'll be like i want you to really think about who would be in a carnival back then in the 1930s who was fleeing populated centers who was looking for safety it was definitely not mostly white people <laughs> right yeah yeah Right. It was like a carnival is one of the few places women could access outside of gender norms and trans and non-binary people were actually celebrated, although also manipulated and taken advantage of. But generally when it's at like a regular Monster Hearts game or just a regular game at the table, I will try to be like, OK, so let's just keep in mind diversity and inclusivity and trying to make sure we have a really good diverse group of characters who come from a variety of backgrounds. And then I usually give an example of the character I would play. So when I was playing Fall of Magic, I was like, I'm going to play Ella Mura, who's the hero of Barleytown. And she has ochre skin and she's got dark eyes. And so kind of like deliberately explaining, I'm not playing a person, of, uh, a white person, I'm playing a person of color. Right. So leading by example is probably a really good way to go as well. I've seen that help. But if people absolutely refuse, do you really want to play with them? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I've never run into the like obstinate case. Like, so I don't even know what I would do, honestly. I, I'm not, I, I'm, I, yeah, I would probably just be like, well, you you either need to get over this or, or something, right? <laughs> like, like if somebody had told me during True Beauty, if they had said, I don't want to play a young person of color, or even if they had given a really good reason, like, I want to, I want to explore what it's like to be, to be a white person in that environment, right? Like, I, I just don't, like, I don't know what I would have done. Like, I have no idea how to handle it because I probably would have just said, no, you can't. And that would have been the end of it. And if you don't like that, then you need to go play something else. But yeah, so yeah, it's a thing though. It's just been on my mind. You know, it's been on my mind lately. Like, because I, as a GM, I'm, I've been trying to like actively play NPCs who are people of color, right? I've been trying to like break out of like defaulting to just like having a white character all the time or whatever, you know? But yeah, it's just been on my mind. But yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think, I think the approach, if you have a group that's like playing in the spirit of the game and and not being just completely a jerk, um, I think just probably just talking really honestly about what you want to accomplish or or what we should be thinking about is probably sufficient. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember that it's okay to say no to our players. It's okay to be like, no, you don't get to play a white person today. Absolutely. Yeah, because there's always that hedge person who's like, there are no orcs in this world. And they're like, well, I want to play an orc. And you're like, okay. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> There's always that hedge person, and it's okay to be like, you know what, actually, I just said no orcs, right? So it's okay to do that. Don't feel like if you're going to sit at a game of cartel and someone's like, I want to play the white dude, you can be like, yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, it's an expectation setting thing at the end of the day, I suppose. It's kind of the main deal. I think, you know, communicating really clearly with the play group, like what we are trying to accomplish or what your expectations are is probably like just the, the easiest way to handle it. All right. So our first question is actually from an anonymous friend of the gauntlet because it's a bit of a long question. What's the best way to handle and manage players with system mastery who repeatedly correct you as a GM or push on advanced rules and elements? Related, how to handle when you're teaching rules to new players and those veteran players insert themselves in the process and overwhelm and confuse the new players? But most importantly, how do you manage those behaviors while still celebrating the knowledgeable player for their expertise and effort? Uh, that's a great question. So I will say at the outset that this is not something you run into very often when you run more indie or niche games like like I do. And I know like what you principally do as well. It doesn't happen quite as often because these games aren't usually as established and so don't have as big a fan bases to draw such players, right? Nevertheless, I do often find myself in a situation where I have 
I'm either playing with the designer of the game, <laughs> like I'm running the game and they're the, the designer's a player. That happens a lot. Fair. Uh, and I do, and I do from time to time run into a situation where e- even though they're not being like a, you know, a rules lawyer or whatever, there's a person at the table who I know beforehand is definitely more knowledgeable about the game than I am. Right. And the way I usually handle this, and I think this gets to the last point of that question of sort of acknowledging their, their, their expertise, you know, in my opinion, I think that players who behave this way probably just want to have their mastery acknowledged in some way, right? And so what I do in the case where the players aren't actively trying to like assert themselves, but I know that they're more experienced than I am, but I think it works in both cases. What I do is I give them a job. I put Mm -hmm. them to work, right? So my favorite thing to do is to say, hey, Chad over here is the most knowledgeable person about this <laughs> game. They have read it and played it way more than I have. They're going to walk you through character creation and I'm going to go get a I'm going to go get a pop while they walk you through <laughs> character creation, right? I've done that. I do that to this day where, you know, I'm like, "Hey, you know what? The designer of the game is here on the call or or here at the table. You know, I'm going to let them walk you through and I'm going to go, I'm going to go chill for a minute. I'll be back in a minute. And what I love about that is it gives that person a chance to show what they know about the game and it acknowledges their expertise in the game. But also what it does is it indicates to said person that I have the authority to delegate things to them. Right. Mm, And does that make sense? Yeah. I haven't thought of that angle. (laughs) Yeah. So it, it's like, I have the authority to delegate these things to you. And also, it also kind of like, I don't know, I kind of love the idea of like, you guys deal with the logistical things. I'm coming back to deal with, to help with the story, right? Like, that's my role here. And so, yeah, I like that. I think that's a great approach. I think it solves that problem. Whenever I have somebody at the table who I know is more knowledgeable about a game than I am, I, I do something like that, right? Or I give them a, I give them like a really like an important task, you know, like, like in the game, like some kind of, you know, something related to the rules or something like that, you know, that's way nicer than my advice, because my advice comes from (laughs) being the one who's often had games mansplained to me over and over and over again. This is actually why I won't play FFG Star Wars. Oh, really? Yeah, every time I have, there's been a guy who's literally explained my dice to me every time I rolled. Oh, yeah. I'm sure the yeah. circumstance is not quite the same. I have played that exact game, though, and had that situation where not just the dice, but there's also somebody who's way more into Star Wars than I am. Yes, that's why I don't play canon. If, right. Yeah. And who wants to like <laughs> who wants to like canonize everything for, you know, oh, boy. Yeah, I don't play that game either. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah so if you're one of those people who does that, don't do that. Oh, my God. Don't. Yeah, just stop. <laughs> <laughs> like, just don't. It's bad. So what I do when this is happening, because once in a while I will run a, a more, uh, they're usually trad games I find this happens in. Just yeah, yeah. There's so much knowledge for those games. I will get like a group buy-in where it's like, okay, so we're not going to open our rule books. We're not going to go there. But if something does need clarification and I will like indicate that person and be like, I'm going to turn to you and you're going to answer it. It's your job. But if I don't agree with you, it's because I'm deciding not to use that rule. Yeah, that sounds legit. That's the closest I can get because otherwise I will just tell people to piss off. <laughs> well, this is this is the in GM masterclass we're looking for. We're looking for solutions. That's not that's not a helpful solution. It's just to be like shut that shit down. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think that whoever posed the question, I think they really got to the heart of the matter with the, at yes. the end of it, where they said, "How do you?" acknowledge their knowledge because that's all it is that's that's honestly all it is these people just want to have their knowledge of the system acknowledged at the table and i kind of get it right like it's the ego right like the ego Mm -hmm. wants this you know and if you have spent countless hours you know with burning wheel or whatever and you know exactly how duel of wits is supposed to go or whatever you know i kind of get it you know you kind of want people to acknowledge that i get it that makes a lot of sense it does and i get yeah this is where I'm wrong. I understand this. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> but no, I'm yeah, yeah, no, for sure though. But it's yeah, but it's it's yeah. Give them a job. That's. I think that's the smartest thing to do. I think yours advice is like the solid <laughs> one. I think I'm gonna start doing that for those times I run D and D, which I do when I run Fifth Edition because I don't know all the rules. I'm just like running it to fill a void. And someone's like, "No, this rule." I'm like, "Okay, cool. That's great. Let's roll with that." That person knows what they're talking about, but. 
for interrupting the game and like overwhelming new players, that's when I would ask, let's maybe just hold off, let them make their characters, let's get playing. And if we have questions, then we'll ask you. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I also think it probably depends a lot on the setting and stuff too. I mean, there are a lot of variables here, right? I mean, I think it's definitely okay to tell those people in the case where you're trying to teach the game. I usually say something like, I have not run this before. I kind of put it on me, you know, Mm. like I'll say, you know, I'll say like my experience with this is pretty limited. And so I want to be very deliberate in how we unpack everything. And so we're going to take this real close step by step. And if I get something wrong, if and you notice I get it wrong, like, please let me know. You know, I kind of like frame it that way a little bit. I've done that before, too. So it's kind of like you're kind of like making yourself kind of vulnerable a little bit so that they don't feel the pressure to have to be like, oh, who does this person think they are or whatever, you know? Confrontational. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I used to actually do that in retail a lot. Like, oh, that was my mistake, even though it wasn't just because it makes people like back off. I've done that too. Yeah, absolutely. I know that story. <laughs> all right. Anything else you want to add for how to handle that player with all the, all the knowledge? <laughs> no, I don't think so. All right. Question two, how do you approach a player who disdains safety procedures like lines and veils, the X card, etc., and refuses to acknowledge them, but doesn't go out of their way to actually break them at your table? What a great question. Uh, I'll start by saying that I have not personally encountered this in games I have run. I have never had a situation where I can tell the person is disdainful of, of safety tools. However, I have been at conventions where safety tools are being actively denigrated uh, or where one or more players at the table are kind of rolling their eyes while the GM explains safety tools. So I know this is a thing, even if it's not my personal experience. I know this is a thing that happens. I'll tell you what I'm inclined to do. And I think this is maybe why I don't run into this so much is because I'm a, I'm a sort of like cut the shit off at the past kind of person. I like to kind of actively demystify safety tools. I think there are lots of ways of doing that. I know something that like you do and a lot of other people I've talked to, you know, they like to practice with the X card, like they show how the X card works, you know, beforehand. I think that's a great way of demystifying what the safety tools are. The way I do it is through my my expectations setting cats procedure. This is a procedure that was created by a gauntleteer named Patrick O'Leary a few years ago as part of it was actually his submission to the 200 word RPG challenge that year. So what it is, it stands for concept, aim, tone and subject matter. And I subject matter for me is where I talk about safety tools. And so what I love about that procedure, we've talked about this before, Kay, but one of the things that's nice about it is it has the nice side benefit of being the the moment where you get to be on stage as the GM, like kind of talking, you know, it's kind of practice mm-hmm. for being on stage. But it also has the benefit of really clearly laying out what your expectations are at the table. And the reason why I think this is so effective for safety tools and why I think it helps break down people's barriers about safety tools is it equalizes safety tools to things like the concept of the game or the tone of the game, right? And I think that's important because you probably have the one player who thinks this person doesn't care about fun, they just care about safety. So for me, like by putting safety tools on par with these other things, it's kind of like saying, well, you know what, it's no more important than those things, but it's still as important as those things, right? It's an equalizing thing. And it's just kind of matter of fact, it's like, okay, we're going to talk about the concept of this game, that's important. We're going to talk about our goals for today, that's important, the tone, that's important. And also safety is important. That's how I do it. And I've never had any problems. Fair. One of the things we do at Breakout in every con that like our team now goes to is when someone's doing something like making fun of the X card or we would call it being an unprofessional gamer, like someone who's just kind of being a bit, yeah, yeah, like they're not being professional about it, which is fine. It's not really a profession, but we're going to pretend, right? Someone who actively needs an adult in the room, those kind of people. We now just say, oh, we don't do that here. Okay. Right. So if someone's going to be like, oh, well, the X card's stupid. It's like, no, we don't do that here. You cannot like the X card. That's fine. But you don't get to make fun of it because it's helpful for other people. Yeah. I have to say, I was really, you know, I don't go to conventions much. Uh, This, the last year and a half is like, or not even that long, really, last year, I would say, has been the first time I've like started as an adult, at least, to go to conventions. And I was pretty shocked by how many people bad mouth the x card and stuff like that right i was like holy fuck like these people are really and it's and it's so it just seems so childish to me like it just <laughs> they're seems not the very most childish. professional right it just they seems need like an the adult room child... yeah it just seems the most childish bullshit like 
you're a fucking adult. We're all fucking adults. Like, and being a fucking adult means being able to deal with this thing in an adult way, not getting your ass chapped about it. You know, like, I just, ugh, it's so annoying. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, I sorry. can't imagine how that feels. <laughs> no, I know. Yeah, I know. I just I can't believe it. But but here's the thing, though. This is outside the scope of our conversation. But I was at Dreamation and I was in this game. I'm not going to say what game it was because I'm not trying to call anybody out here. But I was in this game where there was no conversation about anything about subject matter, tone, safety tools or otherwise. It was nothing like that. And the game was a fucking garbage ass mess. And I left an hour early because I could not stand it. And Oh, wow. And I remember thinking at the time. If someone had just said literally anything about safety tools and an expectation of like behaving in a good way, we would have avoided 90% of this because it would have put everyone on notice. Oh, yeah, I need to be a fucking adult. I need to like be respectful, right? I think that's the main thing. It just sends a signal of we we all care about a basic level of human decency here. <laughs> you know, like yeah. let's, let's conform to that, right? I don't know if this is your experience or not, Kay, but my experience, it's not even so much that like the tool is there and people are using it. It's just the fact that you have gone out of your way to acknowledge yes. the issue of safety that helps create the good space. Yeah. And I did a poll recently as to what people found to be like red flags versus orange flags versus yellow flags in a game where you're like, oh, that person's making me a little bit uncomfortable or I'm going to keep my eye on them or, oh, God, why am I playing this game? And one of the things people said was like a soft warning signal about this person might be not the best to play with is when they don't actually explain their safety tools. They just say, everyone familiar with the X card? And they move on. I've had that happen to you. Yeah. At, at I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> I've done Everybody that. Everybody get it? Awesome. Good. Boom. Good. <laughs> Good. Right. Because I just assumed they they brought in. So this time when I was at Fan Expo and I was running games, I would actually ask my players to explain the safety tools to me. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it's like, hey, people familiar with the X card? Cool. Can you explain it to me? And then once everyone had had a chance to add something, I'm like, cool, do we all understand and buy into this? And I made sure everyone said yes and looked at me and nodded. Yeah, got, that's good. I got buy in. And I did the same thing when I do lines and veils. I hand everyone a blank index card and I ask everyone to write down their lines and veils. And if they have nothing to write, just write no issues and hand it back to me. So they're still participating, even if they don't have something they want to write down. Yeah. So it's it just I make it. So that I'm bringing them with me as opposed to being like, this is a goddamn X card and you're going to fucking respect it. I think we're both saying kind of the same thing here, which is it's about buy in, right? I mean, yeah. it's about buy in. It's about setting an expectation. And for me, it's it's really about demystifying and equalizing the concept of safety tools, right? Like be thorough, but just be matter of fact about it. Like, hey, this is an important part of the game. We're going to do it. But it's one of several things that are very important. You know, I think our, our role playing culture will get there to where we don't have this issue anymore. But it's definitely still out there. I have seen it. Yeah, I also do a technique now where I will actually just like put myself on the table and be like here's when x cards have been used against me and when i have used them myself so i was playing monster hearts and someone wanted to name their aunt's character aunt linda i have a horrific aunt linda who abused my grandmother i don't want to say that word ever so i'm just gonna x card that name and that's how aunt leanne was born mm. right or i'm a massage therapist you want to hear me describe an injury i can do it really really <laughs> well I've been X carded so many times for graphic violence. I don't even think about it. I'm just being anatom like I'm anatomical with it. People are like, Kate, that's gross. Well, well, and also, and that's another way, honestly, that's another way of demystifying it. And going back to the previous question, because you as a GM are showing a certain degree of vulnerability there, right? Yep. And you're kind of breaking down a barrier that might exist between you and the player, which I think is probably a great way of mitigating this stuff and getting them on board. Yeah, I think that's the key. And then this weekend, I walked out into the hall to check on if my game was even running. And there was someone checking into GM, one of the convention guests. And was arguing the X card with one of my new admin team. So straight white man arguing with an amazing gender fluid woman about the X card. And I'm standing there and I'm like, I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to get involved. <laughs> I'm just going to see what happens. And flawlessly, she looks at him and goes, if you don't support the X card, you can't run games here. <laughs> and I was like, Th that, I yes, <laughs> I'm going to go sit down. You've got this. The X card is not a restriction on play, you know, no. like it's not, it's so, and it's so strange that like people always perceive it as you're censoring me. Yeah. So I think 
the other flip side of that is if I'm going to play a game and someone's going to roll their eyes at the X card, I'm probably going to look at them and say, like, look, I've had stuff come up in games and I'm not really going to play with you if I don't trust you to respect what I need. Yeah. You're scaring me right now. You're, you're upsetting me a little by telling me my safety doesn't matter to you. People usually respond well to personalized notions of being scary or being uh, hurtful. They don't mm. usually mean to be. So when you lay it out that your behavior is actually making me feel not cool with you, a lot of people will stop and listen. Question three. What adjustments do you make when it's clear a player is not interested in any of the presented hooks? If the rest of the party is into it, what tricks do you know of to spark the interest slash hook into a reticent player? Well, here, again, I am a cut it off at the pass kind of person. So I mostly, not mostly, I exclusively run one shots or short series of four to five sessions. And a short series of four to five sessions is really just a big, long one shot. I don't run ongoing campaigns with the same group of people. And so hooks are really important. They're the way we get things going, right? Even in something like Monster Hearts that is not so GM driven, even Monster Hearts has you present either a party, a school dance, or a fight, right? Or whatever it is yeah. like, to get things going. That's a hook. And so I, I really actively think about the hook that you're going to be using for the, we'll just say for adventure games for ease of conversation here. I try to think about what that adventure hook is. And then what I do to get player buy-in, buy-in's our theme for today, to get player buy-in is I use what I call establishing questions to give the players an opportunity to personalize their character's interest in the hook. So I recently ran the original Ravenloft module. So recently, God, it's been like six months now, but I ran the, the old Ravenloft module and that has a pretty classic adventure hook to it, right? The characters have received a letter from somebody in the little village near Castle Ravenloft that there's evil shit going on. They need help and they have silver for anybody who helps them, right? Really, really classic fantasy adventure hook. A little dull, in my opinion, but it, it's, it's something to get them going. <laughs> but what I do, what I did in that one is I presented establishing questions to add a little bit of depth or nuance to this journey to Castle Ravenloft, right? And so I have some examples here of those questions. To one of the characters I posed, someone important to you went missing there, meaning at Castle Ravenloft or in the village. Who was it and why have you so far refused to investigate their disappearance? And so straight away, the player is not just thinking about, okay, I'm going to Castle Ravenloft because that's what I'm being forced to do. But my character has a they know someone who might be there who went missing and who I have been denying for some reason. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so the answer I got, just to see how this works. The character said it was my mother who was also an outcast from the church. Previously, I never went after them because I thought that I might be shamed by our church community. But mm. now that he himself has no standing within the church, he wants to go find her. So suddenly he's got this, we have a lot more texture, a lot more nuance to, and a lot more reason for his character to be on this Ravenloft thing. One other thing real quick, a really easy one, particularly for adventure games, is a question like this, where I said, okay, this old witch who raised you used to speak of an object in Castle Ravenloft, possibly magical, but definitely very valuable. What is it? Why do you want it? And... That's a pretty standard kind of fantasy MacGuffin thing, but it lets the player define the MacGuffin, and therefore they're a little bit more invested in the MacGuffin. Fair enough, yeah. So for this, we're talking about like setting up the premise where we're going to get buy-in at the very beginning. I have a pretty strong policy on reticent adventurers. Like, don't come play a game about going to Castle Ravenloft if your character doesn't have a doesn't, reason doesn't, doesn't want for to go to wanting Castle to Ravenloft, go. Right? Yeah. yeah, like I don't, I don't get why you would play a game about adventure if you don't want to go on an adventure that baffles me a little i haven't figured out those people if it's happening during the game though i would stop and just ask them like i would take a break and be like so uh, you know you seem really into this part and you seem this into this part i'm not really sure what it is you want to be doing i'm obviously not doing it for you what would you really like to see for the next half of the game like essentially do stars and wishes in the middle of your game mm -hmm. and just see what they want to be doing or i would continually just put them in the moment and be like okay so what are you doing what are you trying to accomplish what here interests you or what do you want to see i would just ask a lot of those questions and also give them an option to be like you know if you are not feeling this game it is okay we are not offended that you are not feeling this game but you don't have to sit here and like suffer two hours more of a game you're not yeah. enjoying 
because not all games are for everybody. Yeah. And this is another one of those situations where, you know, there, there are a huge number of like variables in terms of like the environment you're playing in that could have an effect on this, right? If you're at a convention and you know you only have to commit for two or four hours, maybe you just kind of silo that person for the next hour or so until it's over. And then maybe afterwards, if you really feel the need, maybe ask them privately what you could have done to make it more interesting for them. But, you know, but otherwise, we're on a limited time thing. I may not ever see this person again. So let's just get through it. That, you know, that feels like a legit option to me in that circumstance. If it's a circumstance where it's your home group or a group that you play regularly with, I think the stakes are different, right? And so, yeah, you mm-hmm. definitely have to be more proactive in how you, how you kind of cope. You know, for me, the way I run games is I do these short series of four or five sessions and I always have a mixed group of people because it's kind of a quasi public sign up process in the gauntlet. And so I usually have like one or two people who I play with regularly and I know what floats their boat. I know how to get them and, you know, excited. And then I'll have like one or two people who I have limited or no exposure to, right? Like I don't know anything about how they like to play. And that's why I do try to use like really strong, specific, almost leading questions in the beginning to to really get them kind of hooked in because we don't have the luxury of figuring each other out right in the beginning, you know? And so, you know, it's kind of like a cutting to the chase kind of thing for me. Something I'll do like midstream and here, I mean like between sessions or like at the beginning of a, of a second or third session, I will sometimes say, and this is particularly for like non-adventure games, like, like a monster hearts or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'll say something like, we're still going to play to find out what happens, but let's just have a conversation about what kinds of things you'd maybe like to see. Like, let's throw out, let's brainstorm some ideas. Like, what would be cool? You know, we have the school dance coming up in Monster Hearts. What are you hoping happens at the school dance? Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but what are you hoping happens? And that way I can kind of get some sense at a meta level, at least, like what the person's interested in. And that can kind of help as well. It does. Yeah, I think one thing PBTA does really well is it has really strong, heavy questions, right? Like across the board, you usually if they're well done, you walk away from your session zero being like, fuck, yeah, I'm I'm so excited. I'm ready to do it. Yeah, exactly. And recently, I was playing masks with Agatha from the gauntlet. And she asked us, what character arc do you want for your character? Hmm, yeah. We were three sessions in. We had one more session left. So she was like, what's the last thing I can deliver to you that will make this session sing? Nice. And yeah. we had to sit there and be like, oh, shit, what does my young hero like? What would what would change their <laughs> right, character yeah. at this point? And I thought that was really provocative for a game. Like, I don't understand Max. I don't like heroes. It's a whole weird genre for me. So the fact that she's even letting me play is bananas. But she was like, what do you think your character is going to? I'm like, oh, oh, I get it. Never mind. I'm good. We're good. Well, but I love that, though, because like I'm kind of with you in that regard. Like I superheroes mean nothing to me. I've (laughs) I've I've almost less than zero interest in superheroes, but I am interested in being asked what kind of story arc I'm interested. That's interesting. Right. Like I like that, you know, like that's so yeah, that's that that would get me, you know. Yeah. The only thing I'm going to caution is if the player seems really focused on their phone or looking down a lot or not engaged because there's clearly something else distracting them or there's something else going on that you might not be privy to. It might be better to just leave them alone and check in the next day and ask if they're okay. Those are the people I usually find are dealing more with anxiety or an external disruption, like some sort of family drama or personal drama. And those are all valid reasons to have a shitty game. And they might just want to be around their friends for that four hours. That's a good point. Yeah. That happens to me more often than anything else at this point. But it is often enough that I've learned to just be like on a break, pull them aside and be like, hey, I notice you're doing X, Y, Z. Are you OK? Well, that's a great way of recontextualizing or reframing the the player who's seemingly distracted right right <laughs> three it, it years might ago not be candy crush <laughs> yeah three years ago i'd have been pissed at that person and been like you need to hit it because uh-huh. you're pissing me off <laughs> so, i remember <laughs> I, that was one of my like soft warnings when i was like listening to the early gauntlet podcast and it was like let's talk about those problem about the players. knitters <laughs> god damn yeah. those knitters and i was like i knit at the table because it helps with my anxiety screw well, you jason yeah, that was one particular <laughs> knitter to be to be fair to be perfectly clear that was one particular knitter who ruined it for all other knitters for me so <laughs> no. okay. but no, for sure i you know i mean you know it's a different time so <laughs> i guess yes 
For sure. So always remember your distracted player might also be like fighting a war you can't see. Right. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's good. Just empathy is good. Do you want to read the Slack question? I do. Yes. Okay. So from the Slack, we were given a question from Matt Hales. Matt Hales, incidentally, has some work that will be appearing in Codex in a few months. Matt asks, how do you safely play with players with trauma? And I took this to mean like playing with players you know who have experienced trauma. Is that right? I would assume that you have a heads up that the person has said, I don't want rape at the table because I've been raped. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I put in the notes, well, so I'm gonna let you answer this, but I'll just put in the notes as a, as a, <laughs> as a pressy here that I have never encountered this where I know some, I know for a fact someone has trauma and I've had to like process that. So I have no knowledge here. So I'm excited to hear Chip say. See, I feel like you're wrong. I feel like, you know, I've had a lot of trauma and you still play games with me. I've never run so, a game. I've never run a game for you. Though. No, but we played a GM list game together. We played like three sessions. Yeah, that's uh, true. Fall of Magic. And there was heavy shit in that game. But you were the facilitator, though. See, like it yeah, wasn't my role. Still. It wasn't my role to be the manager of it, is what I'm saying. Fair enough. All right. Uh, <laughs> but you have. You just don't know I'm still you in have. the clear. Probably... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. And I've definitely I know I've played with people who like have had traumas because, you know, a lot of people have. But I've never been I've never been in a situation where like I've been aware of it and I have to navigate it. Right. I've never Fair. had that. This is one of the reasons I love lines and veils and I don't let that support tool die is because it lets people anonymously if you do it right it's anonymous it lets people anonymously tell you what they don't want included in a game and you can hardline it right away so that Mm -hmm. you're not gonna stumble into something so i'm gonna assume this question isn't actually about how do i deal with lines and veils and this is going to be a question about How do I deal with the player at my table who's had a traumatic experience, hasn't broadcasted that, so I don't know to avoid it, and now we're in a shitty situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So my best example is always Bluebeard's Bride or Monster Hearts. These are the two I find bring up a lot of traumatic content for people who deliberately go into it looking for it in a way. Yes. That's true of Bluebeards, isn't it? I've run into that before. Or of of, of like not in my games, but like I've talked to people who like have said, I I play Bluebeards because I want to feel it. Yes. I have never played Bluebeard's Bride because I have been I'm a rape victim and I'm not ready to play Bluebeard's Bride. But I totally respect the people who are survivors and are using Bluebeard's Bride as a tool to safely explore the feelings around that as long as they're broadcasting it to each other, that they're victims of trauma. So when you're in that moment and a person's like, oh, by the way, (laughs) this totally happened to me in this game, there's a series of things you can do. The first being an obvious check-in, right? Ask how they're doing, how they're feeling, And you can usually tell if you're okay at reading body language, and I appreciate not everybody is, if they're okay. Like, if they're still engaging, they might be laughing because laughter is an easy way to, like, mitigate your stress. Yeah. Um, We see that in horror games a lot. If they're making eye contact, if they're looking at other players and not in a, like, oh, God, they're looking at me way, then they're probably okay. And you should probably keep going and have an X card on the table and cut and break cut and break is really really good for this because it lets them immediately just be like i need a break yeah if you're at the point though where the person is like i'm fine to keep going and they sit there and they look at their lap and they're very still and they're very quiet and when you engage them they kind of say what and then look at you again they might be dissociating they might be having a flashback there's no way forward from here yeah that is a game you need to kill because it's not your job as a GM to handle their trauma. Yeah, that's a great point, actually. It's a really good point. Right? There's there's nothing you can do as an untrained therapist. <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so just like a, as a sort of like practical question, follow-up question there, as the GM, how once you realize something like that is going on, how do you how do you present that to the table? Like how do you present ending the game to the table? What do you say? Uh, when I have done it, I said, you know what? I'm not really comfortable continuing. I won't okay. say why. I'll just okay. say I'm uncomfortable because it turns out your safety as a GM matters too. Right. <laughs> yes. That is – it is a thing. You can't tell, this is a, a kind of a somewhat – related story but like well it's it's kind of this is i'll tell you that like being in a position where you are 
viewed as either a point of contact or a or an authority figure or something like that, such as it is as a GM, right? It, when you're in, in the hobby, when you're in any kind of position like that, you – and I'm sure this is true in lots of industries, obviously. But like in role-playing games, I find that people do want to put stuff on you sometimes, you know? And that was one of the things I had the hardest time dealing with when I, when we first launched this podcast, right? Like once this was the first, like after the first six months or so of this podcast, I had more people than I've ever had in my life. Like tell me things like, wow, this show is really important to me. Like this show helps me through a lot of dark times. Like this show, like I've had, I've had people tell me like I was this close to like ending my life, but like just hearing your voice every week. Oh my God. <sighs> And, and and there are situations I feel like it's when you're used to being a GM and you're used to being – when you're used to interacting with people in a way where you have to negotiate like topics like this in a kind of improv-y, free-form-y way. I think that like your instinct is to want to help or want – and you want to empathize. You want to – be that person, you know, but you can't as the GM, as the person with, uh, you know, your, your bit of authority at the table, you have to manage yourself as well. You have to take care of yourself. You do. And it's important to remember that when someone's in a dissociative or, or depersonalized state, you're not trained to help them. Exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but if we're going to talk about like, not those moments because those moments happen i find few and far between but those are the moments i remember the most are when things go south like that like it's bad make sure you're getting buy-in from everybody like if you know you're playing with a traumatized player that's where your content warning comes in that's where your lines and veils come in your x cards your cut and break and make sure you broadcast that you're totally on board with what they need but also that you're not comfortable re-traumatizing them yeah set some boundaries and stick to them that's good i really honestly i think i think the advice of like once you realize it's getting out of hand it's to no one's benefit to try to salvage the situation it's to no one's benefit nope just end it you know i mean it's really not i mean that's how I, you know that that game i walked out of a dreamation that was my when I, I chose to walk out, even though i was not told beforehand that there was an open door policy but i chose to walk out because I was like, there's nothing to be gained from me trying to explain to these people why they're being so gross right now. Like, there's nothing to be gained in this moment. The only thing that can be gained is me recapturing a degree of, like, comfort and dignity and walking the fuck out of here. You know, like, there's just – I think you have to make a decision. And, and that makes a lot of sense from the GM standpoint. Like, there's nothing to be gained from trying to rescue the situation. Some games need to die. Absolutely. Don't be afraid to kill it. And also don't be afraid to say you're not comfortable running for your traumatized friend for their trauma. Like if you're going to run Bluebeard's Bride and you're like, hey, you I'm get a that Bluebeard's victim. player. Yeah, I would tell. Right? I, yeah, I would. I would be like, I can't do that for you. I'm so sorry. Like, right? like, <laughs> yeah. I'm not comfortable doing that. And you can say that. That's OK. I would never be offended if one of my friends was like, kid, I don't <laughs> know that I want to play Bluebeard's Bride with you because I'm concerned about you. That would ruin their fun. And it, honestly, it would ruin my fun, too. Yeah. Right. I don't want to get all re-traumatized around people. <laughs> I don't. I just don't. But I am going to add quickly, if you are a person who's traumatized and you're going to go play a game about your trauma, you need to get everyone's buy-in for that. You don't get to just sit at a table and try to re-traumatize yourself or explore your trauma without your fellow players and GM buy-in. That is not consensual and that's mean. Good point. Shall we go to Giving uh, Me Life? Yes. Hi, listeners. I have three things to tell you about this month. The first is that Codex Asphalt is now available in our $4 Patreon feed. This is our biggest issue ever. It features Pack of Strays Wolf Run, a card-based game inspired by Fall of Magic set in the Pack of Strays universe, Wheels on the Road, an original post-apocalyptic Forged in the Dark game, and much more. The second thing I want to tell you about is GauntletCon 2018. GauntletCon 2018 will be held from October 18th through the 21st. The full schedule of over 200 games is available, and Gauntlet Patreon supporters can register for those games right now. 
The last thing I want to tell you about is the Codex Volume 1 Kickstarter. Yes, that's right. The Gauntlet will be launching its very first Kickstarter campaign on October 2nd. The campaign will be to fund a beautiful hardcover book collecting the first 13 issues of Codex. We want to go all out to make this book as gorgeous as possible, to make it the ultimate gauntlet collector's item, but we will definitely need your help to do so. Also, we'll be making a limited number of these books available at a deep discount for our Patreon supporters, so be sure to keep your eyes open for this campaign when it launches October 2nd. For more information on everything we do in the gauntlet, go to gauntlet-rpg.com. Thanks. It's giving me life. What's giving you life today, Jason? At this precise moment, <laughs> GauntletCon 2018 is giving me life. Actually, it'll be giving me more life in about an hour and a half when I have confirmed that the website has not completely melted down. But generally speaking, it's giving me life. I'm super excited about the work that you and your team have done for GauntletCon 2018, Kate. It's very impressive. I mean, we're, we're up to 200 plus game sessions. Oh a lot of the chatter about panels is awesome. It just feels like so much more like it feels bigger than last year, right? And it should. It's, you know, it's, it's the next year. But it feels like everyone's just really excited. Importantly, Everyone is excited, but not – like last year's excitement was all about being excited because certain people were were running certain games. It was like this sort of like fanboy, fangirl excitement that was kind of going on last year, I felt like. And people were excited to get in certain games. This year, it feels so much more egalitarian. Like this year, it's like everyone's just excited because there's so much cool shit and so many choices. And I'm just excited to hang out with all of you. And so that's where I want GauntletCon to be. And it feels great. And thank you so much to you and, and your folks for, for doing an awesome job. Thank you. They are an incredible team. It's been a good year for me. Just I think I made the preliminary schedule, and that's all I've done this year. I literally delegated everything else. It's good, yeah. Delegation is sweet as fuck. <laughs> it's the best, and yeah. it made me really happy to see members of the Gauntlet come into the Gauntlet Con team and take that power and authority and like just run with it and do mm -hmm. cool things with it. I'm so excited for everything they're doing. So, like, yes, I kind of did, like, one aspect of it, but really most of it's them. Yeah, no, I mean, and I'll, and I'll just say from my vantage point, too, like, GauntletCon writ large, it's really nice that it's it's one of the few things that I am not super directly involved in, in the Gauntlet, right? And that feels great. I helped organize the RSVP site, but that was just working with the developer for like 10 minutes that didn't take very long <laughs> like for the most part like i have i don't have to deal do too much with it and that's really nice it's nice to see well gauntlet con's a great example but also yoshi's spearheading the gauntlet games now thing yeah. uh, which which is originally you actually provoked that conversation which caused us to create <laughs> gauntlet games now but the, but, but the point is like i've had nothing to do with that like that's been completely Yoshi and, and and the people he's working with have been doing that within the Gauntlet spaces, which is so awesome. I'm, I'm sourcing the logo. That's it. Yeah. And we brought Yoshi on for Gauntlet Games now for the Thursday of Gauntlet Con to like mm -hmm. have just that going on, which I'm very excited for. It's just such a good community event, you know, like. Yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome that like that's what Thursday is for. I love that. So that's almost giving me life. I mean, it will tomorrow. I'm recovering from Fan Expo today. So I helped run my last year at Fan Expo this weekend. Oh, congratulations. Um, thank you. It's bittersweet, right? <laughs> yeah. It's been 15 years and eight of those doing organizational things. But what really gave me life this weekend, I was running a game of Crossroads Carnival. Mm-hmm. At the table. And like, I only have a few copies that I, I stole from Magpie. Not stole. They gave it to me. <laughs> so I haven't really been selling my own game. I've just been telling people to go to Magpie and buy it. And we ran this game. And it's the first time since the, the new rules have come out that someone's fully saved a town in every aspect. They like found mm. multiple people to help. They really worked together. They didn't try to kill each other too much. Like it was... It was really beautiful, and it, it just gave me so much life. And then at the end of it, this one couple who was playing with me, Phil and Mary, they were like, can we buy this book? And I'm like, well, I only hardly have this copy on me, but if you want it, it's $10. And so 10 Canadian dollars later, they're like, it's our anniversary. We spend every anniversary at Fan Expo, and this is our anniversary gift to ourselves. Thank you for like letting us Aww, play this game. Yeah. And it was that moment where I was like, I don't know if I want to leave Fan Expo. <laughs> I mean, like, I get, I get it when you are one of the people in a place who is making that place better or like doing <laughs> things to make it not hot garbage. Yeah, it's 
difficult to step away from said place. I know this from experience in professional contexts, <laughs> like not not gaming contexts necessarily, but professional contexts. I know what this is like. And I think it's good you're walking away. I do too. I, I, I don't have like actual regret, just that little bit of like bittersweet sure. sadness. But watching one of my new admins be like, you don't get to run a game unless you have an X card. Like, there were just so many moments my team gave me Victory. life, too. <laughs> right? Oh, I was like, ah, fuck yeah. Bobby's got this. <laughs> yeah. So that gave me life. Getting to, like, to face my own game to write, like, a happy anniversary. Thank you for playing my game for a uh, yeah, couple's, like, 40th cute. wedding nice. anniversary. was great. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here, Jason. <sighs> I'm happy to be here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks everyone for listening. Have a fantastic week. 